Friends, let us uh, understand the basal, basal accord. Um, it is an introduction to basal accord. Firstly, the first uh, basal that came into the pipeline was basal 1. That was in 1988, what happened is the basal committee, that is the BCBS committee in Basel, placed in uh, Switzerland, published a set of minimum capital requirements for the banks, which was known as 1988 Basel Accord or Basel 1. Now, what was the primary focus of this accord? Now, friends, as we say today, when we are into the banking business, the banking business is full of risk exposure. The banks are exposed to a variety of risk, right? And then with so much of competition coming in from the global players, today the banks need to protect themselves with a minimum capital adequacy. So they need to have a proper capital base so that they can survive, they can face the risk that is approaching them. In, with that context, the Basel was, was introduced. So the Basel 1 accord, the Basel accord was primarily focusing on the credit risk. They were more concerned about the credit risk that was prevailing in the banking sector. In this Basel accord, what was done is the assets of the banks were classified. Now, what are the assets of the banks? The loans and advances, whether it is fund based or non fund based. The, all the loans and advances that are given by the bank are their assets, okay? Now, these assets were classified and grouped into five categories, right? Depending on the risk, credit risk weight, depending on what is the collateral which we have, which we have collected, collateral or the primary security which has been taken over uh, for the lending purpose. On that basis, the credit risk weights were allocated to all these assets of the banks. It was ranging from 0, 10, 20, 50 up to 100 percent. So depending on the risk uh, factor, the credit weights were given, the credit risk weights were allotted to these assets. Assets like cash and coins usually have zero risk weight. As we know, there is no such credit risk in, involved as far as cash is concerned. Why? Because it is 100 percent liquidif liquidifiable. I can liquidate the cash, uh, it is a liquid uh, money actually. So while unsecured loans might have a risk weight of 100%, wherein there is no security attached to that asset, to that type of lending, yes, they are unsecured and that's the reason the risk is pretty high. It can be up to 100%. Now what was the purpose of Basel 1, friends? Why was there a need for coming up with this concept altogether? Basically, it was to strengthen the stability of the international banking system. So, across the globe, the variety of banks which were existing, in order to bring a stability in them, this Basel 1 was brought into existence. It was to set up a fair and a consistent international banking system in order to decrease the competitive inequality among international banks. So, there was a lot of competition, as we said. In this global environment, the competition is intensifying. And when the competition is intensifying, everyone wants to survive, right? If I have to survive, I have to bring in more and more innovative products in my gamut of services. So every bank is craving to bring in more and more hybrid products into their gamut. Now, when they are craving for bringing more and more uh, innovative products, definitely the risk exposure is going to intensify. So when the risk exposure intensifies, there the challenge comes in. Then the competition intensifies, the risk exposure intensifies and that brings instability in the banking system. With the intention of stabilizing the banking system in the international parlance, the Basel Accord was brought into the picture. It was basically to set up a minimum risk-based capital adequacy applying to all the banks and the government in the world. So in order to bring in equality in the functioning of all the banks in the international, uh, international sector, there was a minimum risk-based capital adequacy which was brought in. Now as we all know, there are a variety of 
risks exposed by the bank which can range from a credit risk, liquidity risk, settlement risk, market risk, interest risk, currency risk, operational risk, legal risk and management risk. So there are a variety of risks which the banks are exposed to and when the risk is very high there has to be some capital adequacy which needs to be maintained as far as the Basel Accord is concerned. Now the constituents of capital, the major two constituents of capital are tier 1 capital. Now what is tier 1 capital friends? It is a core capital, right? Core capital and meeting three criteria. What are the three criteria to have this tier 1 capital? Firstly, it is common to all the member countries in the banking system, right? So whatever, uh, what, whoever is into that parlance, whichever banks are are functioning, the tier 1 capital is going to be common for all of them. It is wholly visible in the bank's published accounts. So it is disclosed capital. So whatever is disclosed, whatever is visible in the books of accounts of the bank comes under tier 1 capital. It is an important bearing on the bank's profit margin. So tier 1 capital is actually going to bring in profitability for the banks and that's the reason it is said to be the most crucial part of my capital. The second is tier 2 capital which consists of less pure form of capital, right? Which, what is that uh, pu uh, less pure form? It is in the form of undisclosed reserves. It can be asset revaluation reserves and hybrid security. Then there is another three, third category of capital uh, which, is, which consists of short dated debt instruments. So the debt instruments, the short dated debt instruments come under tier 3. Actually they uh, form a part of tier 2 capital only but just for our understanding we have bifurcated the total capital into three tiers. And what does uh, tier 3 comprises of? It at least has 50% of the total capital must be tier 1. So what is the requirement under Basel uh, 1? The Basel 1 accord, the Basel accord says that at least 50% of the total capital must be tier 1. And then there are additional ceilings for individual tier 2 and tier 3. Tier 3 should not exceed 250% of tier 1 capital. So these are the basic guidelines on the basis of which the uh, the capital adequacy has to be maintained by banks across the globe, okay? Now, what is the Basel norms and Indian banking system? So, when we talk about Basel, Basel Accord was uh, signed for all the banks in the international market, right? In the international financial system. Now, there were certain changes, certain amendments that was done by the Central Bank of India, that is the Reserve Bank of India, as far as the ba Indian banking system is concerned. Now, what was that? Banking Accord was established in 1988 and was implemented in India in 1992. So, when was that brought into existence in India? It was in the year 1992. Over three years, the banks with branches abroad were required to comply fully by the end of March 1994. And the other banks were required to comply by end March 1996. So there was a buffer given, there was a space, a gestation period given to the banks to comply with the Basel norms. The RBI norms on capital adequacy was at 9% which was more stringent than what the Basel Accord, the Basel Committee had stipulated which was at the 8% level. So we try to make it more stringent, the RBI kept it at 9%. So now in a, the Indian banking system was required to maintain a 9% capital adequacy in comparison to other international banks which were stip having a stipulation of 8%. The commercial banks, cooperative banks, regional rural banks all were brought into the parlance of Basel Accord. There were certain pitfalls which uh, gave the way for Basel 2. In fact, there were some pitfalls in Basel 1 which were taken care by the Basel 2, uh, Basel 2 norms. Now what were the pitfalls? It was limited uh, differentiation of credit risk. The credit risk was only categorized into the five, uh, five uh, major, uh, major, size, uh, major uh, risk weights that was 0%, 20%, 50 and 100. 
The static measure of default risk, that is the assumption that a minimum 8% capital ratio is sufficient to protect the banks from failures does not take into account the changing nature of default risk. Now friends, as the exposure increases, the default risk can also increase. There can be a variety of ways in which the default can take place. So that all things were not taken into account when the Basel 1 was structured, well, was designed. Then the third important pitfall that was seen in Basel 1 was there was no recognition of term structure of credit risk. So term was not given any importance. The risk, only the credit risk was given importance. What is the duration of the credit risk was not given that impetus. So the capital charges are set at the same level regardless of the maturity of a credit exposure. Whether the risk exposure is for 1 year, 2 year, 5 year or 10 year, that was immaterial. Simplified calculations of potential future country uh, counterparty risk, right? The calculation was very simple. The risk weights were assigned to the different credit risk exposures by the bank. Now, what happened is the current capital requirements ignored the different levels of risk associated with different currencies and macroeconomic risk. So, the macroeconomic factors were not taken into account while deciding on what is going to be the credit risk. In other words, it assumes a common market to all actors, which is not true in reality. So, they were giving importance to all the factors in the same level. So, all the factors were kept in the same parlance and there was no true reality into the bifurcation. Now, there was a paradigm shift that was brought in by the Basel II norms. So, we will just compare as to what Basel I was talking about and what is there in the new accord. Now, what the existing accord uh, was focused, the focus of the first accord, that is the Basel I, Basel I, was only on one single risk, that is credit risk. They were only concentrated on the credit risk. Whereas, in case of the new accord, it was introduced an array of credit risk strategies. It also gave an introduction of operational risk. So, the new accord was giving impetus to credit risk as well as operational risk. In the existing accord, the treating of all the borrowers under the same risk category irrespective of their credit rating. So, all were brought into the same category, right? So, there was no such bifurcation which was done on the basis of the credit ratings that existed for different, type, different types of customers. In new accord, there was more emphasis on the bank's internal methodologies their supervisory review. So, all these things were given more importance in the new accord. The existing accord was more rigid, was not that flexible, whereas in the new accord, the risk sensitivity increased, the flexibility increased, capital incentives for good risk management was also given. The basis too is a three-pronged approach relying on three pillars. So, the three pillars that makes the Basel 2 is the three pillars have risk mitigation as their central plan. So, what is the focus of these three pillars? They want to mitigate the risk, right? Allows the banks to evaluate the various risks and realign regulatory capital and more closely with the underlying risk. Now, what are the three pillars talking about? First pillar is talking about minimum capital requirement. What should be the minimum capital that has to be maintained by every bank? What is the supervisory review process which the banks are going to follow? That is the pillar two. Thirdly, market discipline, right? Because the, the Basel II was also taking care of the market risk. There was market discipline which was brought in as a third pillar. So, uh, uh, pillar one, as I said, there we were talking about minimum capital requirement. So, what was that uh, pillar talking about? The bank should have a capital appropriate for the risk taking activities. So, the more the risk the bank takes, the capital adequacy has to be enhanced. But then the minimum capital requirement under the first pillar was kept uh, intact at 8%. The focus was improvement in the measurement of risk. So, they were trying to measure the risk in a better way than which was being done in case of the Basel 1 norms. It prescribes capital charges for credit risk operational risk and market risk. So, as I said, in case of Basel II, the focus was not only on credit risk, 
but it was also on operational risk as well as market risk. Now pillar two was uh, focused on supervisory review. Now what is supervisory review friends? The aim of this pillar was to enable the banks to properly assess the risk they are taking and supervisors should be able to evaluate the soundness of these assessments. So there has to be on-site and off-site surveillance to see to it that the risk exposure is not that huge, right? The Basel, under Basel 2, the banks can choose from a list of approaches to measure the various risks. So there were different approaches which uh, in the later sessions you are going to get an elaborated understanding of these approaches. So just for our understanding under Basel 2, these approaches were used to measure the risk. The variety of risks were, uh, were measured with different approaches. This requires a review of the availability of minimum requirement to implement the approach. The last pillar that is the market discipline. The aim of this pillar was to bolster market discipline, to bring in more discipline in the market the exposure. Why? Right? Because as we said, the risk exposure of the banks was increasing and the banks were exposed to the market, right? And in order to bring in a discipline amongst the banks, the third pillar was introduced. Set, it sets out disclosure requirements and recommendations in calculation of capital adequacy and the risk assessment method. So market discipline was, uh, this pillar was focused more on what should be the disclosure requirements, what should be the, uh, the ways in which the capital adequacy and the risk has to be assessed. The bank should be disclosing pertinent information necessary to enable market mechanism to complement the supervisory oversight function. So that is what the three pillars of Basel norms talk about. There we end with Basel 2 requirements. Thank you.